A little participation this morning. I'm going to start a sentence, and you're going to you're going to fill in the blanks. You know, teachers do that, like pause, and then you say in the words. Okay, here we go. Ready? Mary had a little. It's was white as, and everywhere that Mary, the, was sure to go. Okay, so you've heard it. You know, Mary had a little lamb. Okay, Mary had a little lamb. It's a nursery rhyme, right? We've heard it over and over again, so much so that you know it by heart. There's even a song that goes to it that they wrote around. But it's probably not a story that you were, A, expecting to hear on Sunday morning at the beginning of a sermon. Probably not even a little nursery rhyme that you've really given much, a, uh, much thought about. I mean, why, why would we, right? We don't have discussion groups on Sunday nights of talking about Mary had a little lamb. We're not, uh, you know, dissecting it as a poem. We're not asking really questions. Tell me about the lamb. Tell me about Mary. What do you think this poem even means? Why was the lamb's wool white? What's the significance of that? We don't do that. We don't dissect. Mary had a little lamb. But if we did dissect this poem, we would find that there actually is some inherent meaning in the poem. And if we don't really pay attention to it until we actually maybe change some of the details of the poem. So what if I said, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was matted and stained. Well, that now communicates something different about the lamb. And by changing some of the words in it, we realize that actually the fleece was white as snow did actually carry a meaning. It has an image of youth and perhaps innocence was matted and stained, perhaps communicates that uh, neglect or something else. But what about Mary herself then in this poem? If the fleece has some inherent meaning, there's also some inherent meaning about Mary. Maybe the, the, the lamb is following her because she's kind. And maybe we can infer that she loves the lamb. So no, I'm not actually preaching on Mary had a little lamb this morning but rather understand that sometimes we hear things over and over and over again, and we can miss some of the inherent meaning it was there. But by changing some of the key details, we begin to understand a little bit more about the character or about even the story itself. So this morning, we are actually talking about the flood. We are talking about Genesis chapter 6 through 9, and it is a story, as Aaron already said. You've heard it. Some of you have raised your hands. We know the story of Noah. We know the story of the flood in Genesis 6 through 9. You know who else know, knew a story about the flood? Pretty much every ancient culture. Almost, and I, I'm going to say almost every ancient culture, just because I don't know for a fact if every ancient culture had a flood story, but almost every ancient culture had a flood story. It was one that everybody was quite familiar with, and it was one that they had heard over and over again, kind of like Mary had a little lamb. So this morning we're talking about the flood. We're talking about the great deluge. And even one of the oldest flood narratives comes from ancient Mesopotamia in the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is one of the oldest stories of the flood narrative written in about 2100 BC, so over 4,000 years ago. It's the story of Gilgamesh, and he encounters a name that I'm going to butcher, at Napishtim, um, and that person, I'm not going to say the name again, was given immortality because he created a boat and saved people from the flood. Every ancient civilization has a story like this, and every story of flood narrative communicates something, whether it's Aztec, Greek, um, from China, right? Why does it matter that every culture had a flood narrative? Because every culture would have been familiar with it. And so the biblical narrative then wanted to take this story that everybody was very familiar with and communicate something very specific. The story itself wouldn't have been a surprise. But like Mary had a little lamb, if I were to tell you Mary had a little lamb and I changed the details of it instantly, you would be like, well, that's not how I've heard that story before. So by taking a narrative that is very common within ancient civilizations and they put specific details in it, they now have a very specific message for the Hebrew people. And that is what we are going to try to discover today as we're going to dig deep into this biblical narrative and what makes it different. 
The biblical flood story is covered, like I said, in 6 through 9. So we're going to have to focus on a few key passages, definitely not taking it out of context. Um, In fact, we're going to cover a brief outline of it right off the top. Uh, Go ahead and pull that up, that first slide. So I know you can't see this, so trust me that it's there. You can go home and you could Google or look up on your web search. You could type in flood uh, story Genesis chiasm. Remember that word? We talked about that. We're gonna, it's going to keep coming up. Well, this is just, I wanted to show you an image of the chiasm. It covers all of chapters six through nine. It is a huge chiasm there, and I had to split the image in half. So this is the first half of it, and we're going to use this this morning just to outline chapters six through nine because I don't have the time this morning to go through all of it. But it starts with Noah. We meet him and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And uh, there is the command to build an ark. And there's the announcement that there's going to be a flood. And God, even at the beginning, makes a covenant with Noah and then tells him to bring food into the ark and then commands Noah to enter the ark by the time we get to chapter 7 now, verses 1 through 3. In this chiasm, you're going to see some numbers that pop out, and they're going to start on the first end, and they're going to repeat on the second end. So we have the first of our numbers, seven, seven days waiting for the flood. And then we have another seven days waiting for the flood. And then the creatures enter the ark. Yahweh shuts the door, leaving Noah and his family and all the creatures in the ark. And then we have 40 days of flooding. The waters are increasing. The mountains are covered. We have another number, 150 days days uh, in the ark where the waters prevail. And here at chapter 8, verse 1, we find the center of the chiasm. So kids, if you're paying attention, you want to listen to this. At the center of the chiasm is this. God remembers Noah. I'm going to say that again, and you're going to say it. What does it say? God remembers Noah. Say it again. God remembers Noah. That is the center of the chiasm. Go to the second half of the chiasm. So again, God remembers Noah, and you can see now the inverted pattern of the story. So we hit these numbers again. So we have now 150 days, the waters are abating, the mountaintops become visible, the waters start going back more. We have the number 40 again, uh, 40 days of the flood ending now. Noah opens the window of the ark. Creatures uh, like the raven and the dove, depending on the story, they leave the ark. And then we have the number seven twice again. Seven days waiting for the waters to subside. Seven days again waiting for the waters to subside. God then commands Noah to leave the ark. He finds food outside the ark. He makes a covenant with all flesh, all creation. He, uh, God announces that no more flooding in the future, and uh, the ark is no longer needed. We are men- mentioned again are Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then closing again with a comment on Noah. So that is the great chiasm of Genesis 6 through 9. So we're going to focus on two main passages this morning. So we're going to look first at Genesis 6, 5 through 10. So right at the beginning of the narrative, it says this, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. That's an important sentence to remember. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe the human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. The story of Noah, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close relationship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So one of the distinctions that uh, of this biblical narrative is who it's actually about. Now, we usually call it Noah and the Flood. And in fact, if you're in your Bible or you see the heading, it probably is called Noah and the Flood. And to an extent, we do the text a disservice um, to its intended meaning because when we read all three chapters, there's actually very little about Noah 
And we learn early on that he was a righteous man, he was blameless among his people, and he walked faithfully with God, and we know that he has three sons. But the vast majority of this flood narrative is not about a man. It's about God. And when we read this story as a Jewish Hebrew thinking, remember we're asking questions constantly of the text, and we're asking ourselves, who is this God that we are dealing with? Remember, they're very familiar with this flood narrative. So there's something to think about this God then that is uh, involved in the story, since the majority of it is about God. And then what is it that this flood narrative is telling us about God? What, who are we dealing with? Most of the ancient flood narratives um, did have a God in the narrative, and the God was always, what? Angry. The God was always angry. I went back and looked at some of them. Zeus was angry, and, and it's like all these people. God was angry, and so out of anger and wrath, the flood was sent to destroy. But if we go back and we look at the distinctive of the biblical narrative, we see in chapter 6, verse 6, how God actually felt towards humanity. We're going to look at several translations, and they're just going to pop up on the screen, and I'm going to read them. The first one's from the NLT. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. How did God feel? Sorry, I don't see any anger there. Okay, next one, I'm looking for, I'm looking for some anger. An ESV, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. How did he feel? Regretful, he felt grief. Okay, I don't see any anger there. Okay, uh, the next one, King James, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Okay, still no anger. Go on the next one. And the Lord regretted that he had made the human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Again, no anger. Nowhere in this biblical narrative does it say that God is angry or wrathful against his creation. In fact, God's position, position on humanity has not changed since Genesis 1, since the creation story, since God created us in his image, since he created all of creation and said it is good. God's position on us has never changed. We can go all the way back and look at Genesis 2 and 3, Adam and Eve. They actually weren't separated from God because of their sin. In fact, he came to walk with them even after they sinned. They were removed from the garden, but God was still with them. And even last week, we looked at Cain, and even though they weren't in the garden anymore, did you catch that God was still having a conversation with Cain? Wait a minute, I thought they were moved from the garden. They were banished from their presence anymore. No, God is having a conversation with Cain. God is still talking to Cain, and he still thinks that Cain can be the person that he created him to be. And in that narrative, it was like God was saying, he said, look, and he was warning Cain, sin, Cain, sin is what you do. It's what you do is right. You will be accepted. He's still inviting God, or still inviting Cain to be who he created him to be. God is still telling Cain, you are loved and accepted just like you were before. I don't love you more or less because of the sacrifice. I just didn't like Brussels sprouts and asparagus, man. But I still, but I love you, Cain. And God warned him. He said, sin is crouching at your door. Desire, fear, anxiety, Cain, are crouching at your door. You have to to master it. You are not a beast. You can say enough, Cain. Trust our relationship, Cain. Trust me, Cain. And we know ultimately that Cain did not trust God. He killed his brother, and he was punished, and he was banished from the ground. But you know what Cain heard in his sin and in his shame? We see it in uh, verse 13 in, the, in that story. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. There was a punishment. You have banished me from the land. And hear what he adds in his sin and shame. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. God never banished Cain from his presence. 
God still loves Cain. God still loves his creation. And later in the text, it says that Cain left the presence of the Lord. See, so far in the biblical narrative, God is still exactly where he has always been. Faithful, good, loving. It's our sin and shame that has changed the truth of how we view ourselves and of how we view God. See, God never moved. We did. So why are we talking about Cain again? Jackie, that was last week. I thought we were talking about the flood and Noah. Well, because we have to understand that the separation that has entered the world is not because God left or moved, but because humanity did. And we learn from the beginning of Genesis chapter 6, this flood narrative, that God is grieved, that his heart is broken, that God is deeply troubled. He's troubled by the wickedness of humanity, the humanity that has moved farther and farther away from the intimate relationship that we were designed to be in with him. That verse that I said, remember, at the beginning of chapter 6 says, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. There is a meme that's out there. If God seems far away, who moved? We did. And we're still trying to answer this question, though, in this narrative. It's not about us. It's about God. So what did the Hebrews want to get out of this narrative? What makes God different? Because this God grieves. This God loves. This God sees. This God makes a way. Our God remembers. Our God has never moved. And even despite the extent of human wickedness, he continually invites us back into covenant relation with him. I said there was a chiasm in chapters 6 through 9. What was it? Chapter 8, verse 1. God remembers Noah. Other ancient narratives, wrath of God, destruction. What's at the center of the Hebrew narrative? God remembers. God remembers Noah. God remembers his creation. All of verse 1 says, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and livestock with him in the boat. God remembers. Fast forward to the end of chapter 9. I told you we were going to look at two texts. We're going to dive into this remembering again. Chapter 9, starting at verse 8. And then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I'm confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. And then God said, I'm giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all the living creatures for all generations to come. I've come, I've placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is a sign of my covenant with you and all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds and I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the floodwaters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow, this is God, when I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. And then God said to Noah, yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I'm confirming with all the creatures on the earth. This text in itself, it seems awfully repetitive. Why? Because God wants it to be very clear that he remembers, that he is going to remember. Remember what? His covenant. What covenant? Let's dig deeper into that. Well, God made a covenant to never destroy the earth. He made a covenant with them, and he uses a symbol to confirm and remember his covenant. What was it? The rainbow. Well, in the Hebrew text, and this is where we get the title of the sermon from, in the Hebrew text, it's actually not the word rainbow. It's the word just bow. He uses the word bow. And this is significant because, again, for an ancient culture, it's going to carry meaning. 
So why use a bow for the imagery? What, what did they use a bow for? Hunting, protection, right? So hunting, killing, even destroying, okay? And which direction in the narrative, if you know anything about bow and bows and arrows, which direction is the bow, if, if it were in fact armed with an arrow, which, dif- which direction is the bow facing? Where is this, the arrow going to go? If it's a rainbow, a rainbow, which direction is it going? Right? It's going to go up. So this, what an interesting image of a bow, but it's pointing up. It's facing upward towards who? Towards God. And so in this image, God has put a bow in the clouds pointed towards himself And he's saying, I'm never again going to destroy humanity. This whole paragraph ends up being about the God who knew when to say enough. The same God that knew how to say enough, I'm done creating, I need to take a Sabbath rest, is the same God who's now saying enough, no more destruction. I'm going to make a covenant so that I will remember. And to understand that covenant a little bit more, In a covenant, there's always two parties. Almost always, there's a stronger party and there's a weaker party. Usually, the stronger person is the one that asserts the power and authority over the other one in the covenant. And as the weaker one, you are required to produce the sign of the covenant if instructed to do so. The covenant is usually for the weaker person that when a circumstance arises, the weaker person pulls the sign of the covenant out of their pocket and says, ah, wait, we have an agreement. It's for their protection. But what God does here, he's clearly displayed that he is the stronger, but he puts the sign in the clouds, this bow that points towards himself and essentially says, you don't have to remember I will remember. Because no matter what, even when you forget, I will remember. This flood story is not about an angry, wrathful, destructive God. It's not actually even really about a flood. It's not even really about Noah. It's about a loving God who remembers his creation. God knew when to say enough destruction, and he has a plan to put it back together. This story for the ancient culture was about a God who sees and remembers, a God who made a way for them. He made a covenant with them for generation after generation after generation, a covenant that we know was fulfilled through his son, Jesus Christ.